That was beautiful, thank you. Come, come, whoever you are. We are all welcome here. Our age doesn't matter, our size doesn't matter, nor the color of our eyes or the color of our skin or our hair. We are all welcome here. No matter our gender, whom we love, how we speak, or whatever our abilities, we are all welcome here. We are welcome with laughter in our heart or tears in our eyes. No matter what we have experienced in the past or what awaits us in the future, we are all welcome here. Whether we believe in God all of the time, some of the time, or none of the time, we are all welcome here. This is a community of open minds, loving hearts, and willing hands. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Caitlin, and my pronouns are she and her, and I am a 30-something woman in a blue top and pink hair, and it is my privilege and joy to be your worship associate this morning. We've got a couple of announcements. Our potluck is after service on October 6th. See the email for more details. The auction, do you know when the auction is? Oh, I heard half of it. It's November 9th. When is our auction? November. You guys rock. From 7 to 9. And that, if you haven't been to one of the auctions, is so much fun. And I am not a like auction party socialized person, and it is so much fun. We've got two more announcements. Next week, um, the Neighboring Faiths curriculum starts for the junior and senior high kiddos. Um, there should be an email coming out soon, and if you have more questions, contact Jordan, who's going to wave his hand. And for those who love to sing, choir starts today at noon right here. So come join us if you love to sing. We are going to take a moment to fully arrive and greet each other, and we are going to start by greeting our virtual folks. Can you all turn around and say good morning to the folks at home. We're so glad you found us. And now I invite you to greet each other. Hymn number 317. <laughs> morning and welcome again. It is such a joy to see all of you gathered here in our sanctuary. I will try not to be Italian. <laughs> I don't look Italian, so I think I'm okay. Um, I am the Reverend Laura Young. I pronounce her she and her, and I am a proudly 50-year-old woman with pale skin and red hair and pink glasses. And it is 
my delight to share with you a little bit about what we've been up to in our congregation the last couple of days. Yesterday, we hosted a climate revival. And if you don't know what that is, you don't know what that is yet, you're gonna find out as we go through our worship service today. Yesterday, we gathered uh, with our congregation as well as with First Church, the Unitarian Church downtown, and we began to participate in a process that is shared across 370 other Unitarian Universalist congregations as of yesterday, participating in thinking about what does it take to really show up in this moment for climate justice, how to adapt, and how to, as a religious and faithful people, how to stay in the better story. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that, but our call to worship this morning is gifted to us from the Unitarian Universalist we are Association. So Yep, let's go ahead and start it. <laughs> Welcome to the Climate Justice Revival Worship Service. We are so glad we have entered and come into this place of rejoicing. This morning, we are doing things a little differently. We are joining congregations all over the country for a time of renewal and recommitment at the intersection of the climate crisis and the deep justice commitments of our congregations. Together, we can move past systems and cultures of extraction to usher in a new era with love and justice at the center. We protect what we love. So during this morning's worship, we will be remembering our love for earth, air, fire, and water. We will be tapping into our love for people, especially those first and foremost impacted by climate disruption. We will be celebrating all of creation and recommitting our care and protection. Let's begin with breath and air. First, I invite you to just notice your breathing, however easy or labored it might be. Give thanks for those gathered with you and give thanks for air, always present, supporting, all life. In the spirit of full arrival, breathe again with me. And know that this place is sacred, not because it's designated so on the front of the building, but because you gather here with an open heart, a loving mind, and with helping hands. Let's light our chalice together. Please rise as you're willing and able. And will our chalice lighter please come forward to help with us? Toni Morrison has written, it is not possible to constantly hold on to crisis. You have to have the love. You have to have the magic. That's also life. Join me in saying our chalice lighting words. We are this chalice for the warmth of love, for the light of truth, and for the energy of action. You may be seated. I would like to invite all of our young and young at heart to come forward. We have a children's story also delivered to us uh, from the Unitarian Universal Association and actually read by the president of the UUA, Reverend Dr. Sophia Bendigore. So if you are young and young at heart and you want to get a better view, Come down here and watch the story with me. And then I have a very important task for you at the very end before we sing you out to your projects this afternoon. As we continue 
the celebration of our revival together, I am so excited to bring you a story by one of my favorite children's authors, Kobe Yamada. The images are by May Bisum. This story is called, What Do You Do With a Problem? I don't know how it happened, but one day I had a problem. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it. I really didn't like having a problem, but it was here. It was here. Why is it here? What does it want? What do you do with a problem? I thought. I wanted it to go away. I shooed it. I scowled at it. I tried ignoring it. But nothing, nothing worked. I started to worry about my problem. What if it swallowed me up? What if my problem sneaks up and gets me? What if it gets me? What if it takes away all of my things? I worried a lot. I worried about what would happen. I worried about what could happen. I worried about this, and I worried about that. And the more I worried, the bigger my problem became. I wished it would just disappear. I tried everything I could to hide from it. I even found ways to disguise myself, but it still found me. And the more I avoided my problem, the more I saw it everywhere. I thought about it all the time. I didn't feel good at all. I couldn't take it anymore. This has to stop, I declared. Maybe I was making my problem bigger and scarier than it actually was. After all, my problem hadn't really swallowed me up or attacked me. I realized that I had to face it. So even though I didn't want to, I really didn't want to, even though I was really afraid, I got ready and I tackled my problem. When I got face to face with it, I discovered something. My problem wasn't what I thought it was. And I discovered that it had something beautiful inside. My problem held an opportunity. It was an opportunity for me to learn and grow, to be brave, to do something. It showed me that it was important to look closely because some opportunities only come once. So now I see problems differently. I'm not afraid of them anymore because I know their secret. Every problem has an opportunity for something good. You just have to look for it. And that, my loves, is the end of our story. Can you all help me with something? So yesterday, when we had people from the other congregation downtown and our congregation, guess what I made the adults do? Draw. I made them draw. And that was kind of scary for some of them because some of them haven't drawn very much since they were your age. But they drew a picture for us. It's a long picture. And I am hoping that you will help me display it. So can you stand up and make a long line and we'll unroll this picture so everyone can see it? Wow, let's look at that. Okay, so the adults all made this and this is called their rich picture of climate renewal. And over the next couple of weeks, this is gonna be on display in our RE classrooms and during social hour. And if you are young or young at heart, you can add your own. And together we will fill in this paper until there is no more white space left, because it will be so full of our vision of a renewed and bright future where we are a thriving community living on a peaceful and green earth. All right. Who wants to help roll that up? OK, start rolling it up. Go the other direction, see if you can do it. Collaborative project. All right, we'll start at this side. Let me show you, we'll get it started here. So you roll it and then you pass it because climate justice is gonna take all of us, right? Yeah. It's not gonna be one person 
There might be a lot of heroes involved, but we're all going to have to work together on this, right? Okay, let's get ready to sing our children down to their activities. And remember, there will be some crayons and stuff downstairs, and you can add downstairs after worship. Let's put away the cushions. Thank you. Our storytelling continues, and I'd like to invite Alyssa to come forward. And as she does, I have uh, an announcement that we do have a gift for some of you today. Yesterday, Kevin was kind enough to bring some saplings from his uh, very prolific garden and rich soil. And if you would like a new tree for your yard, talk to Kevin after worship. They are outside on the bench, and you're free to take them. They are oak, pine, and a uh, on the maple, and he can give you all the instructions for how to get that to thrive in your garden as well. All right. So along with this um, climate revival and idea of moving forward into um, our new year, uh, they wanted somebody from the Social Action Council to step forward and just talk a little bit about what we as a social action team have been thinking about. Um, in terms of how we want to, to live into our values for the next year. And so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, so in our last meeting, um, what we sort of talked about was that we would like as an organization to continue to support some of the ongoing projects that we have as a congregation. Um, two of those that um, were ones that we highlighted were, um, one, we are supporting a student, um, his name is Vishnu, he is in Nepal, and we have been supporting his education um, for the last several years, um, and we would like to continue our commitment to um, help him be able to finalize his educational prog program. So um, we just have recently received a letter from him again. Um, we get those a couple times a year, and um, hopefully we'll be able to share that with the congregation and then um, have the youth actually write uh, messages and a letter back to him. And we do that a couple times a year to kind of help get to know a little bit more about what life is like in that part of the world. Um, so we would like to continue our commitment there. We would also like to continue one of our other big ongoing efforts, which is that um, currently three times a month we, we provide meals um, at the youth uh, VOA, it's the VOA Youth Resource Center. Um, so um, along with that, uh, I just wanted to give everybody a huge shout out because it really does take our whole congregation working together to even make three meals happen um, a month for them. Um, but everybody has really stepped up. Uh, and um, the last several meals that we've had, people have given just that little bit extra. And that's important because in the winter time, um, this past year, the, they were actually able to expand the number of beds that they have um, from 30, which was what they had previously, to now they have 50 beds available. Um, and everybody thought that that would end at the end of the cold season, but indeed they were able to find the, the funding and support to continue their um, to offer 50 beds for the entire year. So we have been feeding a lot more people. Um, and it was really awesome when um, everybody brought a little extra food. Joshua was looking at everything that he had to serve and he's like, there's gonna be so much left over. Um, but it turned out, he said, the kids were so hungry that they were able to come back and ask for seconds. And there were a couple people who showed up right at the end, like where they thought they had missed dinner for sure. And he was able to offer them the last remaining food that they had, uh, which was plenty for a very hearty meal. Um, and so 
um, it really, it means a lot that we know that these youth who don't necessarily get to control when or how often they get to eat, um, they know that they can get a healthy meal. Um, and we, we help make that happen. So that's awesome. We definitely want to, as a social action council, continue that program moving forward. Um, but then as we thought about what we might want to do, um, we've, we've toyed around with the idea of trying to maybe make some like more long-term partnerships, sort of like we have with the VOA with someone else. Um, but as, as a team, we didn't necessarily feel like we had a particular calling. We have always selected our split plate offering recipients um, sort of in three different areas. One of them is in the climate justice, um, environmental sustainability uh, bucket. One that we sort of talk about with social justice and one that we sort of talk about with compassionate care. And we try to sort of select a variety of different organizations that we can, we can split our plate with um, that fall into those sort of categories. Um, and so as we move into this next year as a team, what we were hoping to sort of do is to continue that sort of divvying up <laughs> of our split the plate offerings. But uh, we were hoping that we could also, along with that, um, try to select these organizations well and ahead of time, so like a year in advance in some cases, so that we can reach out and try to establish more of a partnership with some of these organizations and ideally find ways that we can support them in, you know, with our, our time and our talents along with the treasure that we contribute through the split plate offering so that we can actually have more meaningful engagement uh, with these different organizations that are in the community. Um, and so that's what we're hoping to sort of do. Um, so in, in that spirit, um, we are also planning um, at the beginning, I don't remember, December? It's okay, it is, I was like, no, it's right at the beginning of December. It is December 1st. So right after Thanksgiving, we uh, hope to do another, um, what do we have? <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanksgiving day, uh, thanks service. Um, so day of service right after Thanksgiving so that we um, can do some projects as a, as a group together. Um, we did that last year. We've done it for a lot of years, but we did that last year here where we met in the sanctuary. Um, so we're going to do something similar again this year and more details will be following. Um, and, and then hopefully we will have several like service oriented activities next year where we will be partnering with our split plate recipients. So that's our goal. In that spirit, we're gonna move into our offering. Our split plate recipient for this month is the Rose Park Neighborhood Center, and there's more information about the good work they do in happenings. Thank you. <laughs> this community, our church, and all its ministries are supported by what you give, whether you give a little bit on Sunday or you pledge, and we are eternally grateful for that. And as I said, our split plate is the Rose Park Neighborhood Center. If you would join me in reading our offertory words, they should be up behind me. We are this church. We are its hands, its heart, its voice. Together we share the wealth of this community and sustain it with our gifts. We will ask the ushers to come forward. There's also a giving link online if you prefer to give that way or if you are one of our folks at home.
for all we have received and all we have found the courage to give. May we be truly grateful. May these gifts be a blessing for South Valley and for the Rose Park Neighborhood Center and their Good Samaritan Project. All gathered here today, both in this space and in our connected and vibrant online community, are invited to participate in our ritual of joys and sorrows. While often we conduct this ritual based and rooted in a place of our personal joys and our personal sorrows, today I invite you to open it up and to imagine that this is a communal space that as we turn our face again to the challenges and the opportunities of climate justice, that we recognize not just the intersectionality of this work, the ways that it connects to racial justice, to disability justice, to religious justice, to poverty, to all of the things and all of the challenges, that it is also going to take all of us to work on those solutions. And so when you come today to our joys and sorrows table, I invite you to come not as one by one as we typically do, but to come in groups of three and four and to surround the table and add your rocks together as a team. And in this way, we will start to build again our sense of connectivity and joy of being in a creative solution space with one another. And we have... And the stone represents the combining of those joys and sorrows for the climate held here in this place to those in our online community. Join me, if you will, in a moment of meditation, reflection, and prayer. You may close your eyes if you wish to, or you can leave them open for today. We have a bit of a slideshow for you images and pictures from our revival yesterday. Beloveds, I know this is a difficult time and it is easy to imagine destruction. In fact, we don't actually have to imagine it. We see it. We know it in our hearts in this place and in this land and we know it on the East Coast as they begin the work of trying to recover from yet another terrible storm that has already taken 64 lives and is sure to take more in the flooding and the debris flows to come. We know this well. Let us be together in this space in a moment of courageous silence as we begin to find our way. We'll hold our silence for two minutes. I know you can do it.
of those delightful yelling children remind us of the work that we are all together a part of. May our generation inspire the next to come for seven more generations in the spirit of creating a new narrative for humanity where all may thrive. Amen. The question proposed yesterday by the revival was this. We can imagine collapse. Can we imagine renewal? We can imagine collapse. Can we imagine renewal? I think it's fairly easy to say, yes, we can indeed imagine collapse. It's easy to imagine destruction, devastation, suffering, displacement, loss, famine, a horde of locusts, war, political unrest, damage from hurricanes, floods, drought, tornadoes, tsunamis, and everything else. That part is easy because our brains are hardwired to avoid pain, and one of the ways we can do that is to imagine the very worst possible outcomes. I suspect that this is an aspect of our fight or flight syndrome. That protective adrenaline rich burst of energy that help us that helps us to make quick decisions under threat. And of course we know that it is woefully inadequate for grappling with existential threats. For existential threats require a wholly different aspect of the brain a part of the brain that must be cultivated, a part of the brain that is trained and trainable towards compassion. Yet in our modern era, with its instant access to news and images of death and destruction and despair, is constantly activating the other part of our brain. And this is unique to the generations that are present right now on the earth. Prior generations had perhaps a few photos or illustrations to support the facts on the ground of their lives. We are inundated with images at all times. And while the supposed intent is to somehow move us to a greater compassion and expression of generosity, the impact is far more often a shutting down and a turning away because our nervous system gets overwhelmed. Our nervous systems are not designed to take in the volume of images, sounds, smells, first-person accounts, analyses, musings, political diatribes. We are not prepared evolutionarily to take all of that in and be moved to compassion. To be moved to compassion requires stepping away from the barrage of images and stepping into the creative space of our individual and collective imaginations. We are overwhelmed. And thus the action we are most prone to take right now is one of avoidance. And we're seriously out of time for that, yes? Hello, welcome. Everyone in this room knows. We also know that we are up to the task. Hello, everyone. Let's just let you all come back in. This is great. The harder and more complex work is to imagine renewal happening among us. As Unitarian Universalists, we have a long history of being concerned and engaged citizens in justice efforts that seek to make this world, the world we live in right now, the one that we can see, this one we can smell and taste and touch and explore, a world worth handing down and onward. This is not to say that we've always gotten it right. Sometimes, as Unitarian Universalists, we have gotten it heartbreakingly wrong. But we keep on trying, and that is exactly what we must continue to do right now. 
Our Unitarian Universalist history is full of people who did the same, who imagined a better future and then worked towards it. We are known as the ones who show up. I am proud of our hard work, not just in this congregation, but in all of the congregations, the 370 plus congregations that are committing today, September 29th, 2024, to a time of renewal for the environment. And I want to invite you to participate in this in whatever way feels the most life-giving to you. To at least get curious with me about what climate renewal might look like, feel like, smell like, taste like, and be like in this place, Salt Lake Valley. And before you start making that mental list of tasks, which you're so good at as Unitarian Universalists because you like to be busy, I invite you to set aside your list making and your task orientation and just in fact to be in this space for a moment and breathe with me. The reality of the climate is very hard. I invite you to rest in this moment anyway. I promise, if you rest with me for two more breaths, that the climate will still be okay. Because this is Sunday, the day of rest, the Sabbath, and rest is a form of resistance. I invite you to step inside an imaginative journey of climate renewal and vibrancy from a place of rest rather than a place of rush, from a place of hope rather than a place of despair, to make that choice because it is a choice. Scaring ourselves and one another isn't going to really work because the work is too big, too complex, too far outside our usual and customary ways of thinking. Now the doomsayers will always claim they are doing us a favor by reminding us just how bad it really is and how scared we ought to be. I ask you this, who in this room was ever saved by that? Nobody, not once. The naysayers and the doomsayers will always be on the wrong side of that proverbial Red Sea. And we can choose to be the ones that walk through the parting of that sea to the other side. Making this choice requires that we pay attention to how we are showing up in the world and for one another. To turn our attention to collectively, collaboratively, and creatively find our way, not just through the parting of the sea. If you imagine what that might have looked like in your mind for just a moment, it probably wasn't a green meadow at the bottom of the Red Sea. There was probably a lot of gunk on the bottom of that sea. And they had to kind of climb over it and it was probably a little muddy. And you know, there was like sharks and stuff like flopping. It was kind of scary, I'm sure. <laughs> but they went through it anyway, right? Because they had a vision, they had a creative story that on the other side, they would arrive to a land of milk and honey. That is the work we are up to, to bind ourselves to a better story. That is why stories such like the parting of the Red Sea stick with us, because they're really good stories. 
and they're capable of moving large groups of people from despair to hope. The parting of the Red Sea is foundational in many, many religious communities of color. And there is a reason for that. Because it is a story of going through adversity, sticking together, being resilient, creative, and collaborative, and finding a way through, even though it is never promised when we shall arrive. It's a story of magic that has a miracle impact. And I'm not talking about the suspension of physics here. I mean the suspension of disbelief and despair so that creativity, hope, and resilience have the necessary space to move us from where we are to where we wish to be. I want to make a side note. The renewal that I invite us to imagine is not rooted in some utopian vision of a perfect world. We know we're not perfect. What we need right now is our imperfect creativity, our incomplete imagination, our unfinished intelligent growth and renewal to meet and collaborate with the edges of the others with whom we are walking and traveling in this life. Because together, my unfinished compassion project, your half thought about how we can move this technology forward, your idea and your idea and your idea and your belief and your adherence to love can combine with yours and yours and yours, and mine. We are here today having this conversation with one another because of the brave people before us who dared to have the necessary and difficult conversations in their time and context. And it is our time, again, to do this together. To engage in this work, we need to root our efforts in hope. And we've talked about hope several times this fall already. The hope and the laughter that comes to us from the indigenous peoples of North America that reminds us that language can be rooted in laughter and that laughter is the source of creativity and resilience. Hope is a wily and irrepressible tool of the trickster. And it is a chief means by which marginalized and oppressed communities have survived millennia of oppression. We need this hope to guide our way. Hope and all her companions that are currently living in this jar of mine, right? Remember how we had hope that first week and we added grit, Resilience, courage, and we added our guides of Sophia and Pandora and the trickster. We're going to keep adding to this jar because yesterday at the end of our workshop, the people there wrote more words. And I'm not going to read them all to you this morning because we would be here till like noon but I want to read just a couple of words that might just be appropriate to go in our jar to join hope. Art, relationship, connection, bird songs, positivity, action, perseverance, diversity, Feelings of love, devotion, seeing, singing, and dreaming. And if you have some words that you think should be in our jar, I'm going to leave some of these cards up here after worship. 
and I invite you to put your words down. What is it that you have to offer? What is your joy? What are your gifts? What do you want to see? Not just the words, but also the images. We'll have that drawing on display downstairs, and you can add your images to that, and you can add your words to these. And I think that if we can do something like this, we're not going to solve the climate crisis overnight, but we are going to take the next step forward. I would like to see us add to our jar the intentions, the approaches, the styles, the poetry, the grounding, and the love of place that we all have and see what we can yet bring forth. I was very encouraged yesterday at our climate renewal because not only was it our congregation, it was our sister congregation, a congregation that for many decades has acted sort of in parallel play with us. And we are beginning to discuss and find ways to have connected journeying with one another. As many of you know, we did our strategic plan together as a community last year and your leadership is beginning to implement and to vision the next steps of that strategic plan. And through all of that, the undergirding of our entire strategic plan is justice and love. It is the foundation of everything that we do because we know that all justice work is interconnected. But here is some other good news. First Unitarian, is also doing a strategic plan this year. And that started me thinking, what if we shared? What if we shared our strategic plan with them and they shared their strategic plan with us and we looked for where our plans and our dreams and our visions were aligned? What might happen then? Imagine the possibilities. That is, we intentionally shift the narrative from playing in our own sandboxes towards one of joyful and shared communities. We not only build a stronger Unitarian Universalism in Salt Lake Valley, we also infect other faith communities to hop on board with us too. There has not been a single community yet that has saved a saline lake. Maybe we can be the first. Maybe we can show the rest of the world together by working locally because the Great Salt Lake is local to us and it is up to us. Maybe we can save our saline lake. And as we work to do that, we simultaneously work on a lot of other justice issues because the Saline Lake is not just something beautiful to go and visit in the fall, and I highly recommend that you do as the colors change. Antelope Island is amazing, and the flies are dead. <laughs> Which is, makes it much more pleasant if you haven't been out there recently. But all of that, that saving of the Great Salt Lake, that enriches the justice work of every effort. Our neighbors on the west side have long suffered from much more degraded air quality and housing. They are downwind from that lake. So our work is housing justice, it is air quality justice, it is racial justice. It is justice for young people who have no choice but to live on the west side because that is where they can afford to find an apartment. Justice for the earth is justice for every single person 
in this valley. It is justice for our trans and non-binary folks. It is justice for our newly arrived refugees and immigrants, our indigenous neighbors, people in this sanctuary, people who go to other churches, and people who don't go to church at all. Earth justice is justice for every human body. And it is justice for all the bodies on the planet. The bodies of water, the bodies of animals, the plants, the beautiful insects, the ones you love like the butterflies as well as the ones you might not like the cockroaches. None of that is worth sacrificing. All of it is worth saving. And I need all of you to join me. I need you. I am trying to imagine it. Will you join me? I hope you'll say yes tomorrow and the next day and every day beyond that because I need you, we need you, the earth needs you. And I think if we do that and we keep sticking like the stickiest flypaper on the planet to a narrative of renewal, we will get there. And I'll pull a 1990s Northern California slang on you to wrap this up and say this about our shared journey. Dude, that would be so sweet if we did that. Thank you. If you would join me, we have a responsive reading. It is behind me and in your order of service. Um, you get to go first. And then I get to speak and we will take turns. You ready? Set? Go. We join with the earth and one another. To bring new life to the land, to restore the waters, to refresh the air. We join with the earth and one another. To renew the forests, to care for the plants, to protect the creatures. to celebrate the seas, to rejoice in sunlight, to sing the songs of the stars. We join the earth and one to recreate the human community, to promote justice and peace, to remember our children. We join together as many and diverse expressions of one loving mystery for the healing of the earth and renewal of all life. We join with the earth and one another. We join with the earth and one another. We join with the earth and one another. And one another. May it be so, and so it is. Again. May it be so. And so it is. May it be so. And so it is. Good. And it will be good. I'm going to step out of that light, <laughs> sunshine. May it be so. And may you be a blessing in your life. May you imagine that as you love the earth, she loves you back. <coughs> She wants for your success as much as you want it and beyond. Let us partner with one another and all the creatures and all of the life, from the rocks to the trees, the birds and the bees, and everything in between. Let that be our benediction and our blessing as we sing now our closing hymn for the beauty of the earth. You may rise as you are willing and able in body, mind, and spirit.
us know that we are together in this, like that sticky flypaper that doesn't let go. We got this. Let us extinguish our chalice together and say our words that we extinguish this chalice but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. And we hold each other in our hearts until we meet again. Please be seated for the postlude. And the seasons are an allegory for man's rising and falling hopes and hope for a better future, as in wading through winter into spring. <laughs> <laughs> 